Yes, but this group is going to be dad, it's going to be people, it's going to be pastor and all. A lot of different titles, a lot of different names with this particular group. Amen. And it's uh, good for my wife and I to be here with the congregation again. We have come and visited a couple times, but it's good to be with the congregation and see what the Lord might be doing in this part of the world. And yes, we are in Roeville, and it may not even be on the map, but, uh, but still, there's people even in some remote areas that love to worship the Lord. And there's people in those remote areas that need to be saved, born again, they need to know Jesus Christ. And so we can't all go to the big city and take the gospel. But we would look in our Bibles this evening, and I trust that you do have yours, over in the, to the book of Romans. Now, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, he's anticipating making a trip there, but he's writing from Corinth. And he knows that the Romans, yes, they were not there under a sympathetic government. And because there were a multitude of people worshiping false gods, they were even, even suffering in different ways persecution and opposition because of their faith. And there were some people who crept in after the gospel had reached them. There were false teachers that crept in to try to direct them away from the proper doctrine of the gospel. And as I say those, I know some of the things in your mind's going like, sounds like today. And the believers, the true believers in Jesus Christ, have had some of these elements at different times that they had to contend with. So in our generation, in our time, yes, there's some things we'll have to contend with. Amen. And um, the Lord put us here in this time because He knows what your talents, your abilities your skills can do in this time frame of the church age to propagate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God did not make a mistake when he put us in the time frame that we are in. He did not do that. And in the book of Romans, he covers some things very early on. He anticipates being there to get some things doctrinally, doctrinally settled before he actually got there. Now, you who have read your Bibles through, and some of you who have maybe taught Sunday school class and things like that, you know that there are quite a few things in the book of Romans that you would continually go to. And if you're a soul winner and you're speaking to the people, well, you're going to be going to Romans pretty often because the apostle really settles it real well in Romans, whether you're Jew or Gentile, regardless of where you're from, and a phrase that I sometimes use in our church, whether you're a rich man, a poor man, a beggar man, a thief, a doctor, a lawyer, Indian chief, everyone in the world needs the Lord Jesus Christ for their Savior. Amen. And so he settles some of that. He settles how some people had deviated. Even after they knew God, they began to not worship God. Yeah, amen. Neither were they thankful. And uh, with those two things right there over earlier in the book, the book of Romans, because I'm going to be in 12. How can some people, and particularly the pastor... How does he know when somebody's getting backslid? Well, there's two steps right there. One, they quit worshiping. Oh, yeah. 
Number two, they quit being thankful. And when people quit worshiping and they quit thanking the Lord, isn't it pretty obvious? I mean, you don't have to wear a sign. Just your manner of life displays it. So he gives them some of these doctrinal matters. He gives them salvation as it is. And then he gets down to chapter 12. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beseech you. He's talking to the saved there now. By the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Uh, that kind of his work gets into being a sticky wicket, doesn't it? Okay. That word sacrifice indicates giving something up. Amen? And I liked in the song a little while ago, I saw those words come up, and I said, wow, that's really even kind of prophetic. You know, it said to, I, about, I surrender all. So I thought, wow, this is really going to go with the message tonight. I surrender all. And he's saying, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy that you present your bodies not to be crucified, not to be burnt, not to be disfigured. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. So that is a sacrifice not to be killed on the altar. No, no. Not a sacrifice that you bring in the blood is shed. This is a sacrifice that's brought that you want the sacrifice to go out and live. But when we sing about sacrificing to Jesus, I surrender all. Is there not a song often sung? At the end of many sermons, and it's sung, all to Jesus, I surrender. And that's a, sometimes a tough thing. Because if you're here this evening and you're saved, then that you means you have the old nature of the flesh. You have the new nature in Christ. And there's that battle that goes on. And the apostle already told them about it in chapter 7. He's already told them there's a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. And that battle rages between are you going to sacrifice or are you not? Are you going to give yourself unto the Lord or not? Now he goes on to say holy. Oh, that's the first word after the sacrifice to go live. Oh, you got to go live holy? Well, we can quickly discern between either holy or unholy. And if we're a sacrifice unto the Lord, then obviously He doesn't want an unholy sacrifice. Even in the Old Testament, they were not to bring, you know, those the, the sacrifice, they were not to bring the lamb. They were not to bring the sick. They were not to bring those other than the best. Holy. We're to live holy. And then it says what? Acceptable unto God. That holiness, and it, which is a reasonable service. Isn't it amazing? I mean, when the, when the Holy Spirit of God had the author write, which is your reasonable service, I don't know what that Holy Spirit voice speaking to Paul might have sounded like. You know, did it kind of come across which, which is a reasonable service? <laughs> God's not going to ask for a holy sacrifice that's acceptable unto Him that's not reasonable. 
Come, let us reason together. And so the apostles even here said, this is only a reasonable thing. That you present your bodies. Some people might be willing to give up some of their fortune. Some people might be willing to give up some of their fame. Some people might be willing to give up a lot of things that they have power over. Positions, power, possessions. They might be, but how about this thing of give yourself? Whew. It's only reasonable, isn't it? <laughs> you, see, you see the argument that God even gives? This is only reasonable, isn't it? You say, but God doesn't know. He doesn't know that there's a hostile government. He doesn't know that there are people of worshiping other gods that are persecuting and hurting them. Well, of course he knows that. They were experiencing some of the things that we do today. Does, didn't they have the difficulty of taking the gospel themselves out to a world where there was a lot of hindrances involved? A lot of rules involved. A lot of ordinances involved. We have some of the same things today. Surely. Your reasonable service. You know what? Present your bodies. Now that phrase. If someone came up with a. Real fine letter. That came by a courier. And was good. Given to you. And it would be remarkable, but if you got one that said, for some reason, the Queen of England would like for you to present yourself before her. What? A monarch of a country wants me to present myself? Wouldn't it be something if you got one from some other place that says that the president or the prime minister or someone else sends something to a citizen that says, we require or request, it could be either way, that you present yourself. Now, right away, you know that when you go to present yourself before royalty, or even if it's negative and you go to present yourself before the magistrate, that you're going to go into that presence in a proper manner. Your conduct will make a huge difference. Now, it says wholly acceptable. We want to come and present ourselves not where we create enmity, but where we appease the one. If you go before the monarch, look, they expect, if you're before the monarch, if you were before an emperor, they would expect some body motions. They would expect some form of dress. They would expect conduct, conversation, in a right, proper manner. Now, the only thing is, present yourself, what? Oh, you're, but in this case, you're going to present your, yourself before the Lord. Oh, wow. This is not a monarch. This is not an emperor. This is not a magistrate. This is not a prime minister. This is before the almighty, holy, righteous God. And we do have a God that's incomparable. Oh, other people may come up with their little gods of this kind and that kind. But when you compare that to the true and the living God, when you compare those to the power of the living God, to the knowledge of the living God, to the fact that this God that we have, there's 
you can't go anywhere but what he's already there. He's incomparable in his word, incomparable in his works, incomparable in his ways. Wow! It's not just, oh, we're going to present ourselves a living sacrifice and do it flippantly, half-heartedly. No, no, no. We're talking about your creator, an incomparable God, an immutable God, a God that doesn't change. You and I change, and presidents change, and queens change, kings change. And they all kind of change, you know, as things go along. But we have a God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have a God that's immutable. He doesn't change just because circumstances might. Amen. We have a God that's unconquerable. We're going to present ourselves before an unconquerable God. If you were, you know, if someone out there who was a non-believer, if they was going to try to uh, overthrow God, what are they going to use? Water? Peace. Be still. You're going to present with water? Oh, water? Sure. I know what to do with water. He'll walk on it. <laughs> Don't you try that down at the beach. No. With that water, he can make it come. He can make it go. What are you going to use? Fire? Oh, going to destroy him by fire. Why? In the Old Testament, there was, the, there was some that believed in God that they threw them in the fire. And when they threw him in the fire, the leader, he looked and said, I see another one in there. <laughs> and the one was, that was in there, kept the other ones from burning. If you read the account, the only thing it burned is it went ahead and released what was bond, the bonds that they had. They were more free in the fire than that leader was outside. They had fellowship with God. He didn't. They knew the power of God. He was just learning. Oh, we have a God that's unconquerable. Oh, he can win wars. He can win fights. Amen. He's even going to win one. He did already. They crucified him. They buried him. And most people would think, that's the end. You don't conquer death. But after three days and three nights, wow, he conquered to man that which is unconquerable. Whew. Hallelujah. Oh, my. Oh, my. You can't even conquer him with time. He's eternal. You can't even out outweigh God. Say, so, well, just give a little time and that God will pass away. No, 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 you know. Oh, my. And he's an approachable God. This is not some God that somewhere on the backside of some unknown planet or whatever. You know, they come up with all kind of stuff anymore. And uh, he's not out there. And you say, well, in order to get to him, I've got to go through this one. I've got to go through that one. I've got to go through that one. And I can only go to him at certain days. I happen to make it. No, God is approachable by his children every day, all day, anywhere, anytime, for any reason. We have a God that's approachable. Whew. Even the sinner, wicked, ungodly, wretched, filthy, in the depths of the miry clay. If that sinner, lost and undone, will by faith, in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, cry out one way or another to God, God will hear as that sinner repents and calls on the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. 
for God so loved the world. Oh, that was up here too, wasn't it? <laughs> wow. It's almost, wow, we almost had the sermon right here tonight, didn't we? Just in the music. He's approachable. He's approachable by some of us, uh, what are they called, as senior citizens now? <laughs> in our golden years. Or you take some of our children in, in the very small classes. And some of those children, they can call on the same God. Either gender can call on the same God. Men, women, boys, girls. They can call. He's a God that will listen and you can approach. He even tells, even the Lord in his earthly ministry said what? Suffer the little children to come unto me. Amen. But he also listened to the senior citizens as well. Yeah, amen. Amen. We've got a God that's like that. And we're to present ourselves to him. It's not like we are just presenting ourselves to the pastor. We're not presenting ourselves to the church. We're presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to the holy, true, living Eternal God, that's who we are sacrificing our life to. Now, he does caution us after telling us, eh, that's only reasonable. And be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. So you can apparently be conformed to one thing or the other. If you're not to be conformed to this world, then you're supposed to be conformed to something else. I'm glad that my theology is not deep. Huh? So many things in the Word of God, isn't, it's not real deep. But I realize that sometimes it's hard to apply because it requires the first part, a sacrifice. Now, if we were to pass out sheets of paper, even to some of our young people around, and say, okay, write on that piece of paper what you consider to be worldly. Y'all look at me. Okay, let me give you some examples so you'll know what to put on the paper, okay? Okay, what do you consider to be worldly music? Worldly speech, worldly goals, worldly dress, worldly jobs. You said, what are you talking about? Look, you don't need to be a bartender. There's some things that is after the world that is not proper in walking that holy life before God. You can be conformed to the spiritual walk. There's others that choose to be, even though they may have gotten saved, they choose to still be conformed to some things of the world. And the caution is, after it tells us to be a sacrifice, the caution formed to the world. The world's going to try to sell you a lot of stuff. Decades and decades ago, I worked for a commercial newspaper. And commercial newspapers sell ads, don't they? Adverti <laughs> advertising primarily, not exclusively, but advertising primarily, you, you know the phrase, need, greed, or fear. Whether it's billboards, magazines, newspapers, TV, unwanted ads on your electronic equipment, what it is, is to make you, either through voice inflection or by visual image, make you want something 
that's primarily of a worldly nature. You got to be so careful about that. Someone trying to sell you a bill of goods. Contrary to what your reasonable service is. Oh, wow. So we need to give up some things. After we give them up, being holy, we need to, not only after we give up, we need to shape up. After we shape up, we need to get serious. The word there is sober. Not necessarily alcohol, but serious. We need to sober up. Then in verse 8, we need to cheer up. In verse 9, 10, need to buddy up. Hang around with those people who also desire that same thing. 11, we need to get fired up. Get excited. And in verse 12, we need to get prayed up. Give ourselves unto the Lord. When we begin to study the Lord, who He is and what He's done and all, it's only reasonable. And then we do, when we give up, well, then we need to shape up. We need to sober up, get serious. But that one on the end, you need to get prayed up. Praise God. Thank you for letting me bring a message.